Welcome to 1917. I'm Ranger Rick and you're at Tumacockery National Historical Park. This beautiful church behind me dates to 1822. Only a few years later in 1848, it's abandoned. And then in 1908, with America discovering how valuable all of the old historic structures are, this becomes a national monument. Well, it's not till 1916 that the National Park Service is actually created. And then in 1917, Park rangers, dressed just like me, are here restoring this church. And today, we're gonna to prepare one of the meals that the park rangers working on this structure would have eaten as part of their daily meals. Today, we're making cornbread, real cornbread. The cornmeal we're using is actually stone ground corn. It'll give a little bit of a nutty texture or flavor to it and a really good texture on the tongue, really tasteful. We're only using four tablespoons of flour just to kind of hold it all together. We're using buttermilk to give it a little bit of a sour taste, and we're using mixed eggs and a little baking powder and salt mixture. Now, what we're gonna do is go ahead and mix all our dry ingredients together first. Then we're gonna go ahead and add our buttermilk to our eggs and pour in a little oil. And then we'll add that mixture. And then we don't wanna to do too much stirring. We just wanna stir it just enough to mix all the dry ingredients up. Using your hands is usually a necessary part of making cornbread like this. Now, at home, you're probably gonna go ahead and use a nine by nine baking um, pan to make this cornbread. Stick it in your oven. You're gonna do it at 400 degrees for about 30 minutes to get it. Test it with a toothpick as normally you would with a cake or anything. You can also do this on top of the stove top using a frying pan. Cast iron, of course, works best. And it actually comes out pretty good. You just have to keep the heat really low and probably wanna keep it covered too. What we're gonna do is do it the way they did it. We're gonna go ahead and use a Dutch oven. Now the Dutch oven is really gonna cook well. We're gonna, it's gonna be really low to the bottom of the Dutch oven. We're gonna go ahead and put a lot of coals on top and very few coals on the bottom so it doesn't burn on the bottom. The Dutch oven is actually well oiled and ready to receive. So let's see what happens when we make it. Normally at Tumacockery, we'd be using mesquite wood to do this, but because you probably are gonna have charcoal at home, that's what we're gonna use. And actually, I'll tell you, it's a little bit easier. We're gonna take about five coals. And notice I don't have any modern kind of stick here to adjust all these with. We're gonna take about five coals though. And then we're gonna sit right on top, okay? Just gonna use this plate here. And I'm putting quite a few coals on the top. because there is such a distance down, down to the bottom of the pan. I can remove and adjust, and remember the coals will burn down fairly quickly. Now it's just a matter of waiting until this gets ready, and I'll be checking it occasionally, looking for a beautiful golden brown appearance. It's been about 30 minutes, so let's go ahead and check. Getting to be really nice, check it. Perfect, nothing sticking to the stick. What I'm gonna do is go ahead and add some extra coals back on top because that'll brown it a little bit more, which will be really nice. Give it a golden brown look. It's perfect. Golden brown, moist inside. Looks good to me, looks good enough to eat. It is. 
I'm, I've got spurs. Er, 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 I got saddle. I got spurs on my boots. You ready? I'm a long dog, Texan. I got spurs on my boots. He came from Texas with spurs on his boots. I'm a long dog, Texan. I got spurs on my boots. He came from Texas with spurs on his boots. People look at me. And what did he say? That's bad grammar and it sounds cowboy. Okay, what is that cowboy having his gear? That cute little girl in the back. I did hat. We did hat already. What about gun? Gun. Well, I got a taste. There were many cowboys who lived and worked on the ranches and they didn't have a gun. I said, wait a minute, how does that work? What did they shoot each other with? That's not the work that cowboys did. Most of them just did hard work and it didn't require a gun. Now, sometimes they would get a gun to scare away a varmint or to turn the cattle that were running in the stampede to get going the right direction. But the movies, they always had a gun or two or three or four with them all the time. And I'm going to tell you a secret. Movies aren't true. But we'll sing about it anyway. Ready? You ready? Thank you. See, I've got to tell you one other thing that was very important in the cowboy gear. That was the rope. And they took really good care of the rope so it wouldn't get tangled up and knotted. So I'm going to say rope and rope. So here we go. You ready? That cute girl in the back there again. I like the way you sing. I'm a long tall Texan. And I've got a rope and rope. He came from Texas with his rope and rope. I'm a long Again, that means we're about done. That means we're about done. That's the way we get a lot of applause from people. We're about done! Yes! I'm a long, tall Texan. I got a big black horse. He came from Texas with a big black horse. I'm a long, tall Texan. I got a big black horse. He came from Texas on a big black horse. People look at me and what do they say? Hi guys, I'm Dorian from Tumacacri National Historical Park and I'm volunteer here and I've been volunteering here for almost a year. One of the coolest things that I've been able to learn about are bats. Bats like to nest here at Tumacacri National Historical Park in the key like this one behind me. Keys are earthen homes built by the Oltan people of southern Arizona. The bats like to nest in the keys because they're warm and safe and they can make families and sleep peacefully. Another cool thing about bats is that they're super important to maintaining healthy ecosystems. Bats eat loads of mosquitoes and help keep mosquito populations at low levels so we're not covered in mosquito bites. Bats do things like pollinate important plants and help to maintain crops like chocolate. So if you like chocolate, then you're gonna love bats. We actually have a lot in common with them. We have a shared anatomy. Think about a bat's wing. It goes something like this, right? They actually have the same bone structure as we do in our hands. Just a little longer and a little lighter so they can use it to fly. We're going to use our hands, just like bats' wings, to do a bat craft today. 
So get some paint, a marker, and some construction paper, and we'll get ready. The great thing about this bat craft is that it's super duper hands-on in a very literal way because we're going to be painting our hands to create the wings and ears of this beautiful bat. You can choose any of these colors that you want, but we've gone with this nice pink color here because it's similar to the color that we see bats at Tumacockery in, which are kind of blonde actually. So your bat does not have to be brown or black. So we're gonna get started first by painting our left hand. So use whatever you need to, to cover your left hand with a generous amount of paint. Don't be shy about it either because you really want your bat to stand out against the night sky. So first, we're gonna come over here to the left side of your paper and just kind of like this, press your hand down at an outward angle. Wait a few seconds, press it nice and hard, and lift up, and there we have our left wing. So we're gonna next go for the body. So just to the center of the page or just to the right of your left wing, paint kind of a little oval here. But your bat could be any shape. If you want it to be a really fat bat, make it a nice fat oval. If you want it to be a really skinny bat, it can be really skinny. Follow your heart and whatever's calling out to you. Okay, so we're gonna do the right side just like the left. So now, grabbing our paintbrush, we're gonna paint our right hand. And if you wanted to, you could even come in here with some other colors, mix it up, create this kind of tie-dye effect. Do whatever. All right, so we're gonna do the right side just like the left. Come here at an angle on the right of the body and press nice and firmly into the page. And there we have our right wing. So now we're actually gonna turn the paper over to reveal the bat in this angle. And we're gonna grab a little bit of paint on our fingers to create the ears. So just like that on either side of the head. Boom, big old ears, great for hearing because it's dark out. When bats are active, they need to hear what's going on around them. So there we have it. There are the wings, the body, and the ears of our bat. And what we're gonna do is wait for the paint to dry. Okay, so now we've waited a bit of time and our paint has dried. So we're gonna go ahead and get ready to draw some eyes, a nice cute smile for our bat, and some cute little bat feet. So I'm gonna be using a marker. You can use a pen if you'd like, a crayon if you wanna paint the eyeballs, or smile, or feet, or you can stick some googly eyeballs. You can do that as well. I kinda like to do an apostrophe eyeball. Looking up, looking for bugs. Draw a nice smile here. It's got cute little things. And I like to draw kind of like chicken feet for his little bat feet. Aw, he's so cute. Look at him. And now, most importantly, we're gonna sign our name. So I'm gonna put mine right down here. Don't forget to sign your artwork so that others can see it and praise you on your artistic prowess. If you appreciate the work that bats do, show them some love and recognize just how cool they are. If you call a dog's feet tails, how many tails has a dog got? Now just think for a moment, it's not all that tough. I don't want to rush you. We got time enough, but most folks think they got it figured for sure when they count up them feet and say the answer's four. And then one will say, hey, you missed the first tail he got. That would make a total of five tails in the lot. Well, four or five, both answers are wrong, and I'm telling you something you should have seen all along. The answer is one. Because if you didn't know, just calling them feet tails don't make it so. My name is Drew and I am a biological science technician. 
and I'm here at the front entrance of Tumacacri National Historical Park. Tumacacri is a part of a network of places designated by the International Dark Sky Association, and these places are helping to preserve the dark sky by limiting light pollution and kind of spreading the word on what we can do to help preserve our night skies. Think about the wildlife that depends on the cycle of day and night, the plants, humans. We all kind of count on these cycles of day and night for health. Um, you think about predators using the cover of darkness to hunt their prey, prey using darkness to avoid their predators, and many species use dark and light cycles to trigger when they need to start migrating or when they need to start a different stage of their life. We have mountain lions, bobcats, coyotes, javelina. The Southwest is very diverse in bat species, and a lot of our native plants rely on their nocturnal pollination and bats are migrating across the state. They need these dark skies and artificial light pollution really affects their life. As long as we've been around, we've been looking at the stars, gaining inspiration, navigating, and wondering. The cultural heritage of night skies really shines here at Tumacacri. The Odom people were here looking at the night sky. Uh, Eusebio Francisco Kino was an astronomer and he studied the stars at this very place. Theoretically, we can look at the stars here in front of the church and see what he was seeing many years ago. But if we don't do anything about light pollution, the things he saw, we may never see again. I like to think of the painting Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh. Um, he painted that in a French village that at this day, you can no longer see the Milky Way. mostly outdoor lighting that is being used inappropriately. And that means putting light where it's not necessarily needed, letting light escape up into the sky. There's kind of five principles to think about when considering your outdoor lighting. Is it useful? Um, this light is on an outdoor walkway and um, people need to see where they're walking. So that light is useful. Is the light targeted? Um, we have to know where we want our light, where is our light useful. Putting a shield like this on your light prevents all of the light escaping up and less light where you need it. Another principle is controlling it. You don't need lights on all the time. We usually want to use a lower color temperature, still think warm colors. Uh, we want to avoid blue light. Um, blue light is disruptive to humans and wildlife. The last principle is light levels. You don't always need the brightest light depending on the situation. So consider what you're using the light for and use the appropriate amount of light. The first time I saw the Milky Way, I was on a rafting trip in the Grand Canyon as a, I don't know, 13 year old. Um, never been outside like that, never been camping. Um, and I'll never forget looking up and seeing more stars than I could ever comprehend there being in the sky. Um, seeing shooting star after shooting star and seeing the Milky Way, it's just like the sky had way more texture than I could ever imagine growing up in a place like Chicago. And a lot of people have never seen the Milky Way in their life. And it's probably because they're living in these bigger cities that have a lot of light pollution and sky glow. The great thing about light pollution is that it is 100% reversible. As soon as we start to consider how we're using our light and use it in the right ways, our night skies can come back just like that. In 2018, Tumacacri National Historical Park became the 100th dark sky place. We are in this designation because of our dark sky quality our exceptional nocturnal wildlife habitat, um, as well as the cultural heritage of appreciation of dark skies. I encourage you to find somewhere where you can get a good look at the stars and appreciate the night skies, um, whether that's your backyard, 
um, your local park, or even if it's to Macaque National Historical Park. You can come to one of our many dark sky programs and learn about the no nocturnal wildlife that rely on these dark skies, what we as humans can do to help protect them, or just come and appreciate the beautiful, beautiful dark skies that we have here. This song was written by Smiley Burnett, G. Notry sidekick. He was a musical genius and a very funny, playful man. But he could play just about anything. He could probably play an old river rock and get, make it sound good. Well, mama don't allow no guitar played in here. Well, mama don't allow no guitar played in here. Well, we don't care what mama don't allow. I'm gonna play my guitar anyhow. Mama don't allow no guitar played in here. Well, mama don't allow no singing in here. Well, mama don't allow no singing in here. Well, we don't care. Mama don't allow. We're gonna sing anyhow. Mama don't allow no singing in here. Mama don't allow no Yahoo in here. Yahoo! You can do better than that. Maybe this would help. Knock, knock. Who's there? Yeah. Yeah. Yahoo. That's right. Well, mama don't allow no Yahoo in here. Yahoo. Mama don't allow no Yahoo in here. Yahoo. We don't care, mama don't allow got a Yahoo. Anyhow, mama don't allow no Yahoo in here. Yahoo. Knock, knock. Who's there? Wah. fun can a person have? <laughs> well, a lot of people say, oh, I can't draw a straight line with a ruler. They say, oh, I, could, I always wanted to be an artist, but I never could. I'm going to give you some handy tricks so that you can go sketching anywhere. Sketching is about is learning to see again you will find some special place that just piques your interest, that makes you want to remember that, that special place. I hold my elbow out, my arm out, and measure. You can see that the left side of the church is as wide as the right side. That gives you your width, and you can uh, bring that right down to your paper, making sure that your elbow's still straight. I've got in my um, basic, my basic shape here for the front side, and I'll scoot this across. And now we can divide it 
into the smaller parts. The builders were so clever about not just cutting it in half every which way. That is about this, this far here. Um, sketch that across there. And then from there, take your thumb, move it up and see how much space is to the top of the next balcony. And so, of course, the archway is going to be in the middle. The um, window or the doorway at the top is right over the archway. And on either side, you can see the, the pillars. Well, they're about, let's see, I, again, I'm measuring with my thumb coming down. And there's an archway in here. So I'm doing the biggest shapes first. And then notice that the um, pillars on the top are, are right, um, they are right on top of one at the bottom. They're a little bit um, smaller than the pillars at the bottom. Now we'll, we can come to the, um, the archway that is at the top. Get that in there. So I am proving that if this is rough, this is not a perfect drawing and that I'm nervous. Lines are a little wiggly. So people worry about getting their perspective right, but if you just lay your um, pencil to the um, angle that you want and drop it down, you'll get it right every time. You don't have to use higher math for this. Architects do, but you don't. Okay, and then um, this little nice square here, here. Going to the top of the um, tower, on the, the bell tower on the right, again, I'm just going to drop my um, pencil down to get it to the right angle. And it's, it's um, again, archway in, in the middle. Let's see, it's a little uneven on top. The fabulous thing about um, sketching is that it, uh, it's supposed to be rough. It's not perfect like a photo. It's just for you. And then the, the would you say the nichos for the um, statuary? And there's a bell in there. I'll go ahead and put that in there. There's also an archway that you can see through to the sky on the other side. Okay, and then at the bottom, there's this uh, doorway um, window. On the side, on both sides, are the uh, little supports for the wall. Let's see. Okay, so we've done all the, the basic shapes. And now you can um, get started on the details. It'll give you something that's like no one else has done before. It's authentic. Uh, if you can use your um, squinting and using your pencil as the, as the ruler, you can get it just right. Then you can go in and um, work on um, the shadows, because right now it's just flat, you know, uh, there's no sense of depth. So with this, a nice morning light, looking up there at the shadows, there's um, shadows on the, on the cooler side, on the east side of this building. Um, there are shadows under the archways. 
Okay, and then on the on the pillars, because they're round, uh, they'll be easily shadowed. Every national park has some historic uh, buildings that connect the people to the place. So here's some shadows here. And with charcoal or soft uh, pastel, you can um, smooth it out a little bit. Now in squinting our eyes, look and see where the darkest darks are. So, of course, the entrance to the um, mission is quite dark. No light in there this morning. Um, it, so every doorway, every window is really uh, quite dark. <clears throat> the shadows will define the shapes. And let's put some shadows back on this side of the building. There are more shadows coming here now. And there are some um, um, spaces for the uh, statuary to be these oval shapes. Now um, for some more texture or some more details, notice that uh, at the top uh, of the, the mission on the right, there is um, some plaster and then there's uh, the remnants of the um, bricks underneath. You don't wanna have to draw in every, every brick in there, but you can suggest it with just uh, some light lines through there. Um, especially here in the entrance, you can see how there's plaster has come off and you, you can see the adobe underneath. And then the background. Here we've got this wonderful building, but what about the background? Well, as an artist, you can move mountains. So let's move the uh, two macaqueries over here, just to sort of fill in this space. And um, we'll um, just lightly um, tone that in because they're far away. You don't have to put in, a, you don't have to put in a lot of details. You know, with a charcoal pencil, you can smooth this stuff around or you can do cross hatching anything to put more um, pigment on the paper. How about some mesquite trees back there, getting some idea of the foliage so that the trunks are, we'll have some more darks down here and that'll make that tree pop out a little bit. And we'll just put a suggestion of some mountains over here. Okay, and we don't, we have a beautiful clear blue sky today, but there are some nice little clouds over here. So you can just um, suggest some shapes like that. Um, so one thing about parks is that hopefully they have lots of visitors. So if you can put some people into your um, sketch, that will show, you know, sort of the proportion Basically, the, these carrot people are just like if you just scribbled, scribbled a carrot shape right there. Uh, put a little pinhead up here, and maybe they're carrying their their back. Oh, maybe they're holding hands with their sweetie. Put another little carrot shape in here. Um, let's. Let's have his knee slightly bent so he is walking over to the um, doorway. And maybe one of their kids. Same thing, just a tiny little carrot shape and with the arms coming out from the shoulders. And you've got the family trip to Tumacockery Mission.
The more you are here, of course, the more details you start to see. If you're taking piano lessons, you wouldn't expect to sit down and have Beethoven the first time. You'd, you'd practice. I encourage everybody to try it. The wonderful thing is that you won't hurt anybody by trying it. And um, uh, don't worry about hurting your feelings. You, you'll get over it. Getting a little colder tonight, isn't it? Uh, but you know, I used to live in North Dakota, and I gotta tell you, it was a whole lot colder there. Now, I want to tell you about a little feller. He's about, oh, maybe 10 or 12 years old. He was ice fishing one day. Uh, a man was watching him from a ways off, and he noticed that boy had a mess of fish. He hadn't even got a bite yet. He was just amazed. And he looked at that boy and he says, my goodness, he's catching another fish. And I've been here just as long as him. Oh my goodness, he's catching another. And so he walks over there and he says to the boy, howdy, nice day, isn't it? And the boy said, mm-hmm. And the man says, well, you're having some pretty good luck today. And the boy said, mm-hmm. Well, do you come here fishing often? And the boy said, mm-hmm. Well, can you always catch fish like you're doing today? And he, the boy said, mm-hmm. And the man said, well, I'm thinking you must know some sort of secret that allows you to catch fish this way. And the boy said, mm-hmm. And the man said, well, if I knew your secret, would I catch fish the way you do? And the boy said, mm-hmm. If I gave you $10, would you tell me your secret? And the boy said, mm-hmm. So the man took out a $10 bill, gave it to that boy. That boy took off his mittens, took that $10 bill, and he folded it and folded it and folded it to a tiny square, and he put it down into his wool pants, put back on his mittens, and he commenced to fish again. And the man said, Hey, are you going to tell me that secret? And the boy said, Mm-hmm. Well, what is your secret? And the boy said, <coughs> What? <coughs> what? <coughs> Keep the worms warm. Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Leonel Pando. Uh, we're coming to you from Tumacacari National Historical Park. We're gonna make some champurrado. Uh, champurrado is a traditional Mexican drink. It's very thick and hearty and sweet and it's, uh, it's good for the soul. We're gonna use a comal. We're gonna use, a, we have a, a fire down here with mesquite wood gathered from around the park actually. And that smokiness will actually go into the, the food itself, into the champurrado itself. We're gonna start off with browning the, the masa, which is a corn flour. It was originated by the Aztecs. The Aztecs, you know, they, they, they gave us corn, they would grind up, and they would make a drink that was called atole, which is the predecessor to champurrado. It was used in celebrations uh, for the kings and queens, and they would cook the flour, maybe add some spices, they added chocolate to it. And then once the Spanish came over into Mexico, into Aztec country, they started adding sugar. And that's what we're making today. We're making champurrado. You can smell the aroma of the cooking flour there, of the browning flour. You can see it brown up. And if you overcook it, it'll get really dark right away. You'll be able to tell once it's done. A couple of minutes, just shake it. 
on a medium heat. Okay. So once you have your masa browned up, now it's time to add the rest of the ingredients. One teaspoon of ground cinnamon, one eighth of a teaspoon of nutmeg. This is really strong, so you don't want to use, you don't want to use too much. Half a cup of sugar, and one quarter teaspoon salt. And of course, salt brings out the sweetness in the food. Mix it up really good. And also at this point, we're going to go ahead and add our milk. Milk is the best. So we're gonna use three cups of milk. And for weak hearted, you can also substitute water if need be. You know, the, the maceta will actually, it'll clump up a little bit. Sometimes it could clump up. But growing up, and you can ask most Hispanics, most Mexicans, if you get a little clump of maceca in your drink when it's end, it's like a little, it's a little extra surprise there. It's a little extra treat if you get a nice clump of maceca in there. And now we're gonna go back over to the comal and bring this to a boil. Okay, so now we're back at the comal. We got our, our hot fire in here. On your stove, you would probably be doing this on your stove. You wanna use a medium heat. We're gonna use a more traditional molinillo. This is made out of wood. It's got a couple of loose parts here. It's got some holes on there. And you, you twist it. And this is a frother, if you will. It introduces oxygen, introduces air into the mixture. And that really, really brings out the flavor of the nutmeg and the chocolate and the cinnamon. So we wanna bring this to a light, a light boil, not too hot. We're gonna add our evaporated milk and we're gonna let this simmer about five minutes. I'm gonna go ahead now and add the last ingredient, which is two, two tablespoons of cocoa powder. And if you don't have any cocoa powder, you can actually use a half a cup of instant chocolate also. There's lots and lots of different methods. Some ask for the chocolate abuelita, which is a traditional uh, chocolate from Mexico too. Actually use piloncillo also, you can use piloncillo. So I was in kindergarten back in New Mexico. Uh, we had a holiday celebration. I remember dancing La Raspa, that song La, Ras La Raspa, yo baile. We danced that song and they gave everybody, they handed out a little booklet of recipes. And this recipe was in that booklet. Uh, it, the champurrado uh, goes great along with bizcochos. My mom has been using these two recipes for at least 45 years. It's delicious, it's wonderful. And that's a tradition in Hispanic families. You go over to somebody's house, you go over to Tia's house, you go, to, you go over to Abuelita's house. And what's the first thing they do? Is they, they direct you to sit down at the table have something to drink, have something to eat. Every time I smell the champurrado, every time I smell the bizcochos, reminds me of home, reminds me of mom. And of course, it takes us back all the way to some of our ancestors, to the Aztecs, who we can thank for corn. And I'm going to say that this is all done. I got some fellow companions here that are going to enjoy some of this delicious champurrado with me. Because it's okay if you drink it alone, but it's much tastier when you enjoy it with your friends and family. That's what champurrado is all about. Super simple, traditional, tasty, good for the soul. Now, young Jack Potter was a man who knowed the ways of steers, from bird nests in their hairy tails to the ticks that chaw their ears. He was a Texican, a cowhand, to the saddle bred and born, and, and he could count a trail herd on the move and never miss a horn. But one day on a tally back in 1884, he got to acting dreamy, and he sure did miss the score. And the trail boss noticed the symptoms and said, Jack, you ain't no good like this. I'll give you 10 days to go and find out what's amiss. 
And this is just what ailed him. For he fell in love for sure with a gal named Cordy Eddy, mighty pretty, sweet and pure. So now Jack, he rode a hundred miles, sweating with the thought of sweets and words to ask her with, the way it fell wrought. I'm just a humble cow, hen, Miss Cordy, if you please, that hereby ask your hand and heart upon my bended knees. It sounded mighty simple, thus rehearsed upon the trail, but when he got to Cordy's house, the words just seemed to fail. It was, uh, howdy, ma'am, how's the crops? How's your mom and pa? But when it come to asking her, he couldn't come to talk. Well, he took her to a dance one night, and the horse she rode was his, Oh, he's a dandy little horse, she says. Well, yup, says Jack, he is. And they rode home late from that dance together, and the old moon was riding high. Jack, he gets to talking about the stars up in the sky and how, how they can guide a trail herd like they do seagoing ships. The words of love and marriage, they wouldn't pass his lips, so he spoke of that pony she was riding, and he said, uh, you'll note he's fancy-gated, and he don't ever fight his head. Oh, he sure is a dandy, she agrees and heaves a sigh, and Jack says, well, you can have him. That is, maybe when I die. He figured she might savvy what he meant, or maybe guess, and give him that sweet answer that he longed for, namely, yes. But when they reached the ranch house, he's still a wondering how to ever pop that question, and he had to do it now. Or wait and sweat and suffer till the drive was done this fall, and maybe she'd be married, and he'd lose her after all. Well, he put away her saddle and then led his pony up to the gate. Says Jack. I, I, uh, I reckon I'll be adrift, ma'am. It's getting kind of late. Well, her eyes, they shone like starlight, and her lips were sweet as flowers. Says Jack. Now this here pony, is he mine or is he ours? Our pony Jack. And her voice was soft as moss. And Jack, he claims he kissed her. But she claims he kissed the hoss. Es fácil olvidar que la mitad de toda la vida y la historia en la tierra sucedió en la oscuridad. Cuando el sol baja y las sombras comienzan a extenderse a través del paisaje, los humanos tienden a encender una fogata, reunir sus familias y compartir historias. Las historias preservan nuestra cultura, nuestro idioma, nuestro humor y, en algunos casos, las advertencias contra los muchos peligros de nuestro mundo. Hay un cuento muy conocido. Cada persona que cuenta el cuento tiene su propia versión. Pero siempre hay una mujer, una decisión trágica y un grito lamentoso del más allá. En un pueblo lejano, cerca de un río, vivía una madre con sus dos pequeños niños. Ella era una madre amorosa, cuidaba de sus hijos con un cariño inigualable, pero había algo que ninguna persona en el pueblo sabía. La madre era una bruja malvada que se dedicaba a maldecir a otros habitantes para su propio beneficio y diversión. Noche, 
pagó por sus acciones. Un demonio se apoderó de sus pensamientos y su mente. La voz del ser maligno en su cabeza le decía que tenía que pagar por sus acciones y sin estar plenamente consciente de lo que hacía, la madre tomó a sus dos pequeños hijos, los llevó al río, hizo exactamente lo que le dijo el demonio, ahogó a sus hijos en el río. Cuando salió de su estupor, la madre vio a sus dos pequeños bebés flotando en el río, sin vida. Se dio cuenta de que ella había sido la responsable y se odió por ello. Queriendo seguir a sus hijos en el camino de la muerte, comió una hierba venenosa que crecía a orillas del río y se quitó la vida. Sin embargo, al haber sido una bruja muy malvada, tenía que pagar por sus acciones, y aunque su cuerpo murió, su alma sigue viva. Por las noches, aún se puede ver el alma de la bruja vagar por las calles del pueblo, arrepintiéndose de lo que hizo, llorando y gritando con voz estridente lamentos que aterran a todo el que la escucha y todo el mundo la conoce como la Llorona.